feed the plants. What's a good little shop of horrors type color here? Do I have a green? Do I have anything in a green? Is there a green? Oh, green, yes. Oh my God, hey, welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theater. This is my theater themed YouTube channel where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see as an independent theater critic here on YouTube. I'm usually based in the UK, but in March of this year, I went to New York for the very first time. And while I was there, I saw 21 different shows. I saw shows on Broadway. I saw shows off Broadway. I saw a regional show. I saw a concert. I saw a woman walking a pig into a Starbucks on Times Square. But one of the shows I saw was Little Shop of Horrors currently playing at the West Side Theater. Now, even though this is an iconic musical that has been adapted for film, it was very nearly going to be adapted for film again with a more recent adaptation. It has been seen extensively in the US. It was briefly on Broadway. It's been off Broadway in the past. It is not running as a Broadway revival, but in a much more intimate off-Broadway theater, which I think is actually perfect for this production and for this show, and I'm going to tell you why. Before I get into today's review, if you have seen Little Shop of Horrors before at the West Side Theatre, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Who did you see in the show, and what did you think of this production? So today's review is going to be all my thoughts about this version of the show, about the differences, about my favourite things about it, about the cast that I saw at this particular performance, and I'm going to be explaining to you why I think this particular version of Little Shop of Horrors feels definitive, like this is the way that Little Shop should be done forever. Stay tuned, you're going to find out why. If you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to subscribe to my staged YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the other content that I will be posting here soon. Also, if you really enjoy it and you would like to become a channel member, click on the link in the description. For just £2.99 a month, you can join as one of my channel members and gain access to early and exclusive videos. Now, let's talk about Little Shop, Little Shop of Horrors, ba ba ba. I don't know where I'm going with this. It's Little Shop. <laughs> So I don't usually do this as the first segment of the review, but I want to talk about the theatre going experience because we just left this show on such a high. And I think so much of this is about this show being in the perfect theatre. We don't spend enough time talking about this, like putting the right show in the right theatre because Little Shop premiered off Broadway, okay? It was never originally a Broadway show. In fact, it wasn't seen on Broadway until it was revived in the early 2000s. And this production did not last for a very long time. This was not a hugely successful Broadway run. It has now been revived in an off-Broadway version. It's done a lot regionally. It's done a lot in high schools. I think the first time I saw it was at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre in a very queer-coded production with a drag queen playing a murderous plant. You gotta love that. But Little Shop is not a big musical. It does not have a big cast. It's not especially long. And so I think it does play very well to this intimate setting. And off-Broadway, kind of feels like where this show belongs. It's not explosive and glitzy, not that everything on Broadway needs to be, but it's set on Skid Row, which is like the back streets. What I'm trying to say is something about having this show in an off-Broadway venue just felt correct. The West Side Theater is not actually that far from the theaters of Broadway. As you're going into the building, they have some decorations, some artwork on the exterior, advertising the show and advertising Mushnik's flower shop. And when you go inside the building, all around are these amazing carnivorous plant sculptures that have been made by art students that are fantastic. I spent a lot of time in the intermission of the show posing with them and trying to look like the plants. Just a little insight as to how I spend my intermissions there. And they have a lot of great merch on display. And then you go into this auditorium, which is not a big auditorium. It is not a Broadway size auditorium. It is just one level. It is very raked. It has a capacity of just 299, which is really not very big. And the stage itself has this gorgeous sort of dark teal curtain with the Little Shop of Horrors sign that can move up during the show and then come back down at the end. And we have the set kind of spilling out from the proscenium, which I love because we have like storefronts and building fronts of Skid Row embedding the production into the theater. It feels very much like it's at home there and it's not going anywhere anytime soon, which it's not because this show has just extended into 2025, 
We're not even into 2024 yet. That is how successful this show is. And they know what they are doing with casting as well. We're going to talk more about the cast that I saw, but they are giving you exciting casting. They are giving you Broadway names in an off-Broadway venue and bringing people to these roles that maybe wouldn't historically have played these roles, for better or for worse. But like I said, more of that to come later in the video. For now, let me tell you about the show itself once it actually starts and why I enjoyed this revival so much. So if you know absolutely nothing about the musical Little Shop of Horrors, it is about Seymour Krelborn, who works at a florist's on Skid Row, a deprived neighborhood. He works for the very anxious and unsympathetic shop owner, Mr. Mushnick, and he works alongside the object of his affections, Audrey. The plot of the show is catalyzed by the discovery of a man-eating plant who Seymour comes to find out feasts on a diet of human blood. Seymour appeases this and the plant grows, which in turn affords Seymour a newfound fame and access to things that he has always wanted but never had, including Audrey. But as the plant becomes more sentient, more manipulative, and more forthcoming with its carnivorous desires, Seymour comes to the realization that he may have to choose between everything that this new lifestyle has afforded him and the morally upright path. With a score by the wonderful Alan Menken and lyrics by the brilliant Howard Ashman, it has so many enduring brilliant songs. I mean, Suddenly Seymour is one of the great musical theatre duets. It has this beautiful message behind it, and it's just so satisfying to listen to. All of the songs that the urchins sing in this show are fantastic, just giving you excellent Alan Menken deliciousness, and Audrey's lyrics in particular in the song Somewhere That's Green are the perfect demonstration of Howard Ashman's excellent propensity for writing a wonderful and heartbreaking I Want song. As a reminder, in the US, many of the publications do not issue star ratings, so I will not be star rating the shows that I saw while in New York, which just means you're going to have to listen extra hard to what I have to say. So Little Shop of Horrors has this classic charm. It is so much a product of its era, its retro, and its kooky. I like that it lent all the way into that with the costuming and just the way it's directed. It so understands classic, like, 80s musical theatre. It doesn't try and do something ultra modern and ultra sleek. It's a very simple staging that keeps a lot of clever tricks up its sleeves. So this production has been directed by the hugely accomplished Michael Mayer, and it's the classic touches that I really enjoy. The urchins being there and watching for much of the show, and then there's a particular song in the second act where they come back on in sparkly red sequin dresses. That's such a classic old school musical theatre thing to do. It's not like some amazing quick change reveal. They've had plenty of time to go and get changed off stage, but just the way they enter and the way that it's put in the show, there hasn't been a huge amount of that kind of thing leading up to it so that that becomes a big moment. I don't know if this is making much sense or if I'm rambling a little bit here, but it's those little touches. It makes for really satisfying musical theatre. The costuming across the show is pretty simple, but effective. We know who these characters are. We get a sense of that. I will say that Audrey wears this sort of knee-length form-fitting black dress for most of the show. And there's a line in the second act, right before they sing Suddenly Seymour, where she talks about having this other job that she's not proud of, and she wears cheap tawdry outfits, not classy ones like these. And she does actually look quite classy in this outfit. Normally that's played as a joke line because she's wearing some sort of leopard print dress and not for me to judge. Like you can, there's a pop vinyl behind me. There, there she is, there she is. Ellen Green as Audrey in the animal print dress. But normally that's played for laughs. And a couple of people still chuckled, I think because they're remembering the concept of Audrey, even though it doesn't land as a joke in this one because she actually does look nice. Tom Broker did the costume design and Julian Crouch did the set design. I really enjoy the set because it just looks like a real street, or at least it looks like a Sesame Street kind of a real street. It looks like a set, but it's given all of those realistic touches. And you know, there's dimensions to it. We can see alleyways going down the back. We see house fronts. We have windows up the top that are occasionally used. They're not pivotal to the show. You don't need stuff like that. But 
we have them anyway. And it's those kind of little supplementary details that make it more satisfying to look at and make it seem more realistic. It's designed with the same level of attention to detail that the streets of Disneyland are designed. Like, you know looking at them that they're slightly artificial, but it's also believable. And they play with perspective to give it a sense of depth, which we can't really achieve organically on a stage unless it's a massive stage, which this is not. But all of this is relatively muted and relatively simple. Seymour just wears, like, a buttoned-up blue shirt with a matching baseball cap. It's not too ostentatious, because we want to provide a plain, ordinary-looking backdrop for the ostentatious and bright and colourful stars of the show, which is the puppetry. Oh my gosh, this puppetry. I love puppets, I really do. I grew up watching like vintage The Muppets Show and all of The Muppets Show movies. I built my own puppet theater, I collected puppets. Like there was a good few years where everywhere I would go on holiday with my family, I'd be like, can we look and see if they're selling puppets? And puppetry on stage, when done well, gets me so, so excited. And Little Shop of Horrors is a great show for excellent puppetry. It's a great opportunity to have some brilliant puppets to create this plant character. So we have these puppets of increasing scale that grow increasingly impressive as well. By the end of the show, you have this plant that actually lurches towards the audience, which is terrifying and fantastic at the same time. You have these like tentacly vine things coming out of windows and you have the plant uh, being sung from off stage and people puppeteering that really impressively and really accurately. The plant is lip syncing for its life very well. In all the pictures and all the footage I've seen of other productions of Little Shop of Horrors, I don't know if I've ever seen as impressive a plant. So I have to shout out everyone who is involved with this puppetry. The original puppet design was by Martin P. Robinson. The puppet design for this production is credited to Nicholas Mayen and the puppets are by Monkey Boys Productions. What a fun name. But it's really excellent puppetry. And what makes great puppetry is that it's characterful. You know, it not only has a purpose to serve, it eats all the people it needs to, it, it moves its mouth to all of the lyrics that it needs to, but somehow even without having eyes, this plant puppet has a personality. And that's A, a testament to good like puppetry direction and good puppeteering, but also the design and the creation of them. Like, it's just great. I really, really like it. Is there anything that I think could be improved about this production? I've already mentioned Audrey's dress. Generally with the characters of Audrey and Seymour, and I'll expand on this a little bit when I talk about the cast, but I feel as though from what I've seen of this production and from watching this performance, I feel that they've been deliberately directed to play their roles quite subdued. And this is a very campy show where you could go very over the top. And if you've seen the film, it's played like this cartoonish horror B-movie type of a vibe. And the level of exuberance that you might associate Audrey and Seymour with is kind of absent from this production. They're a lot more subdued and a lot more just kind of realistic as if they're playing this in a real life context and not camping it up for musical theatre, which all of the supporting characters around them are doing, so it's a little bit jarring. Audrey 2 is played how Audrey 2 is always played. Mr. Mushnick is how Mr. Mushnick always is. Oren Scrivello is how Oren Scrivello always is. And then you have these kind of low energy is how I would describe them, Seymour and Audrey at the heart of the show. So we don't really root for Seymour here. He is at best endearing, but he's not really, he never becomes triumphant as a protagonist. And I think there is the capacity for Audrey to be a lot more sympathetic as well, if they were able to play on the emotions a little bit more. Suddenly Seymour feels like the song we're singing because we're getting to that point in the show and not because it's this inevitable coming together of these two soulmates. I will also say I appreciate a shorter show sometimes, not everything needs to be long, and I think they have condensed this the teeniest bit from other versions of Little Shop that I know, and they've managed to produce a sort of a more tight version of the show. I do miss the occasional verse that has been cut in the title song Little Shop of Horrors. There's at least another like minute and a half of that song that got cut, and I was enjoying the urchins. I could have had way more of that. So I did not see the full principal cast at the performance that I was at. I have some understudy slips, excuse me. At this performance, the role of Seymour was played by Jeff Sears. Jeff Sears, who is an understudy who understudies various roles within the show. I thought he did a great job. Like I mentioned before, the character of Seymour seemed to be directed to be deliberately 
subdued. And I think there are so many other shades that could be found within that character. He's more than just awkward and apprehensive. You know, he has these moments of triumph. And as he wrestles with his morality and the scene where he's deciding whether or not to kill Orin and deciding whether he's actually capable of that. The whole show is really about Seymour's arc as he turns into this hero and he is motivated at all times by Aldrin. If we don't see him rise and fall with determination and sorrow, then he just seems like someone who is being opportunistic. It's very important that he feels like a hero in this downtrodden place who really grows from that, like a plant, if you will, rather than just someone who is taking the opportunities that are being handed to him by the plant, by by the people eating plant. This is a weird show in hindsight. Opposite Seymour as Audrey was Maud Apatow. She had not been with the show for that long, but I thought she was doing a really lovely job. She's not someone who has a huge pedigree in musical theater. I would describe her performance as the performance you see in a high school production of Little Shop of Horrors, where you're like, that girl playing Audrey is doing a great job and she should really think about doing this musical theater thing. That's the performance that Maud was giving in the show at a, at, a, at a professional performance of Little Shop of Horrors. Like it was good, but there are definitely more things that you could bring to the role of Audrey. She started belting at Suddenly Seymour. There's a lot of singing that happens before that. And I was like, oh, okay, that's just not her vocal type. And then in Suddenly Seymour, she let rip. It wasn't the cleanest, but I like that. I do not mind an Audrey who's gonna crack and give me reality and rawness and fragility. I think that's brilliant. Ellen Green as Audrey was never giving you the cleanest vocal. It was a characterful vocal and that's what made it legendary. So I just wanted her to really just let go more and let her hair down, but I thought she was quite repressed and a little conservative almost as Audrey. There were also so many laugh lines that weren't landing. Again, I don't know how much of this was a direction thing because it seemed that a lot of the campy humor of their characters had been deliberately excised from the show, but there were a lot of opportunities for laughs as Audrey that just did not happen. Wow, how many understudies did I see? Ah, so the role of the voice of Audrey 2 was played by Major Attaway. Did a great job, did a great job. A kind of a thankless role because you're just cheering for the plant puppet this entire time, but did a fantastic job. Sounded fantastic, sounded exactly like you would expect Audrey 2 to sound. And it's a very specific vocal that you have to deliver. Major Attaway did a lovely job. As did the urchins while we're talking about vocal performances, bringing not only the vocals, but bringing the sass and the energy. Renette was played by Cameron Hampton, another understudy slip at this performance, which means I also saw Tiffany Renee Thompson and Kadia Sanko. And they were fantastic. They were cohesive. The urchins kind of get my favorite songs in the show. And I really enjoyed the way that they put all of those across. I thought they delivered on the choreography and the vocals simultaneously very, very well. Brad Oscar was playing Mr. Mushnick in a slam dunk piece of casting. Brad Oscar makes so much sense for this. He is fantastic in this sort of long-suffering kind of a role. Brad Oscar, who, if you don't know, from the original cast of The Producers, the original Broadway cast, and you readily associate him with that kind of Mel Brooks style of comedy, which, again, makes perfect sense for Mr. Mushnick. I thought, if anything, he was giving you shtick and comedy, but I thought he could have pushed it even further. I know it's only a small theater, it's not a massive Broadway house, but I would have had plenty of time for Brad Oscar just being more ridiculous. Because you know who did that? Plenty, Drew Galing. So I have waited this entire review to tell you about Drew Galing. Absolutely the standout performance of the show and one of the enduring performances that lives in my brain after my New York trip. Drew Galing was amazing in this role. From having played Dr. Pometer in the original Broadway cast of Waitress, the musical, he is still a medical professional, but he is a little less caring. He is now playing Orin Scrivello, the dentist, and a couple of other roles in the second act. And I did not know Drew Galing was this funny. I just knew he had a beautiful tenor voice, and he is hilariously ridiculous. He was so, so funny, pushing it so far, taking so much time doing the most ridiculous little ad-libs and silly things. And there's a scene where Seymour is pointing a gun at him and he sort of slowly walks up to it and like is playing with the gun, like puts the gun in his mouth at one point, like while he's holding it and just, he does the weirdest, most hilarious stuff. Sometimes you get to see a naturally funny character actor dialing it all the way up to a hundred. And that is exactly what this was. He was taking every single moment and milking it for all that it was worth. He was 
fantastic in this role. It was a revelation, in fact. So I mentioned before that I think this is the only way that Little Shop of Horrors should be done. I would love to see this production in London. I think the intimacy of the venue, the puppetry, it really just shows you the content of the show and the material of the show at its rawest, and it's, you just have everything you need. Yes, I would like for some things to be a little different. I would like for a little bit more campiness, a little bit more vibrancy from some of the performances. I don't think we need for the central protagonist to be muted for everyone else to seem zanier. I think everyone could turn the volume up just a little bit on their characterizations. But just this production and this staging and the way it looked and the way it sounded, all absolutely fantastic. A creative triumph. So if you like puppetry, and more importantly, if you like the musical Little Shop of Horrors, you must go and check this out if you are in New York. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you have enjoyed. Those have been my thoughts on Little Shop of Horrors at the Westside Playhouse. If you did enjoy, make sure to subscribe to my stagey YouTube channel for plenty more reviews coming very soon. Don't forget you can click on the link in the description down below to sign up to become a channel member for just £2.99 to gain access to early and exclusive video content right here on YouTube. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>